You're listening to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, aimed at helping photographers learn how to make the leap from amateur to pro. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, a joint effort brought to you by PhotoFocus and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamira Young and I'm joined by my co-host, the one, the only Skip Cohen. Skip, how are you? Um, I think there are, I think Sheila would say, thank God there's only one. <laughs> um, yes, I am the one and only. I'm good. I'm oh. good. Hurricane season has started in Florida, so oh, if things get strange during this podcast, it's because we're in the middle of a thunderstorm. Um, but it's just a storm, and everybody hits the panic button. Mm. Um, but that's not going to keep me from being part of a great podcast that I am really looking forward to. So if you're good with it, Shamara, I think I'll go ahead and do an intro of our oh, guest today. I'm excited to get started. Go for it. And, all right. Let's do it. Um just to remind everybody, Mind Your Own Business, the foundation of Mind Your Own Business started out and still is. It's all about sharing ideas to help you build a stronger business. And for that matter, a better life as an artist. Now, this is such a fun podcast for me today because we've got one of my very best buddies in the spotlight. Kevin A. Gilligan joins us, and he's an artist. He's an educator, a presenter, a writer. He's a great dad and a husband. And we first met through Tamron at least 10 years ago. But here's something that, that's really fun for me and, and a tribute to the Internet and cyberspace and, and the phone system. For eight of those years, while our friendship kept growing, we'd never met in person. But that never slowed us down from these long conversations about photography and family and life and the industry. And through all that time, this friendship just kept growing. Now, there's so much in his life and business that everyone is going to be able to relate to today. First, he's got a day job as a full-time practicing attorney. Second, when he and I first met, his primary focus was landscape. But today, his skill set has become so diverse, he's shooting a little of everything, including a portrait project that he shared with the public at an exhibition two years ago. Third, one of the very best posts ever shared on the Skip Cohen University blog was Kevin's three-part series, on how to put together your own exhibition. So there are so many of you over the years who have considered ways to show your work, and Kevin's post had just about all the answers. So today we're going to talk about finding balance between careers, the importance of education, diversity in your skill set, uh, doing your own exhibition maybe, and relationship building is going to jump in there, and who knows what else is going to come up. So, buddy. It is a kick to catch up to you today in cyberspace. Welcome to Mind Your Own Business. Wow, Skip, thank you for that fantastic introduction. It's very kind of you. I'm really happy to be here. Shamira, thank you very much for having me as well. And uh, let's get, get down to business. Kevin, we are well, thrilled to have you. I'm glad you liked it because you did send me a check for it. So <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> The secrets come out. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't a check. It was a bottle of wine, but that's okay. <laughs> that's true. I did send you a bottle of wine recently. Yeah. That's true. But oh. I, but that was before this came up, so you know, I didn't, didn't know at the time. Oh, this is going to be fun. Go. This is going to be a good one. Oh, my goodness, Kevin. This is awesome. Looking at your work, it's inspiring, wow. and I'm excited to dive and dig deep into you and your business. But first... Let's kick it off with our favorite first question. Tell us um, a bit about your background. I know Skip went into it a little bit, but give us that personal touch and uh, tell us how you got started and you know ended up doing what you're doing today. Thank you. Great question. Um, you know, I grew up in New York and I had always been interested in photography and art museums, etc. But uh, I kind of lost touch with photography when I was in law school and about halfway through my professional career, I was in a place where I was spending a lot of time in uh, tough neighborhoods and, and not seeing a lot of things that were very pretty related to my work. And I needed to get back into something to kind of fill my soul up again. And so I got back into landscape photography. And so it started with going out to the ocean and shooting and being outside and seeing beautiful things to kind of, you know, supplement, you know, other things going on in my life and bring some joy in there. And then, uh, actually, I tried to turn a bad situation into a good one when in the 2008 financial crisis, I started getting furloughed in my job, as many of us got hit with that crisis. 
And uh, so I started turning my love of photography into a, into a business back then and uh, haven't looked back since then. Wow, 2008, that's an interesting time to get started. Yeah, I guess looking back, a lot of people said, that's a terrible time to start with your business. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, for me, I was like, well, my income's getting cut in one place. And I have this other interest that I love, photography. So, you know, let me give this a shot. And uh, so, you know, probably against what a lot of people would say business-wise, I did it. And I, you know, started, you know, shooting and selling my images and, you know, making myself available to shoot images for people and marketing. And that's kind of how it started there. There's a great line that goes, I do it because I want to, I do it because I can, I do it because you told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> and, and that's kind of the way I felt in 2009 when I left WPPI and started my own consulting company. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because the last thing you were thinking about was, God, what a terrible time to start a new business. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it was also the best time and a necessary time to start a new business. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a real catch 22 for people when they're trying to figure out, well, God, why did he give that up? I, you know, I think if you're really passionate about something and you really love it, then there's no bad time. And, and there's always going to be ways to do it. And there's always going to be ways to, to move forward and get your name out there and, and get work. And if nothing else, kind of like, you know, like, it's almost like a big circle again with COVID, you know, this year, obviously it's been incredibly tough, you know, all over the world. And, you know, you could build up your skill set. You could do other things to prepare yourself to move forward, you know, when the clouds kind of part and there's opportunities again. So, you know, I don't think there's any bad time to start if you're, if you're passionate about it. No, it's true. All right. So let's get right into one of the biggest topics and challenges for so many photographers out there today. And that's finding balance between, your day job and your passion for photography. And it's, it's not unusual. In fact, my guess is that 50% of the industry are made up of part-time photographers. And I don't think that has changed in the last 30 or 40 years. It's always been that way. Going back to the very early film days, there were so many part-time photographers out there that were primarily came out of the educational world and were teachers because teachers were off in the summer. It was a logical connection to photograph during wedding season. And there were so many photographers out there that were taking advantage of that time to create some additional income. So the challenge today is just the same as it was then. It's finding balance. Kevin, what are some of the things you found work for you to maintain your sanity and and balance when you're when you've got two different challenges like that and two very different careers? Well, you've identified a really, really important question and point. Um, I, there's a, obviously there's many parts to it. Um, from my perspective, number one is I think it's really important to get input and have a discussion with the people that you're close to around you. If you're, you have a partner, you're married, you have kids, whoever it is that is really important to you time-wise to have a discussion with them about you know, what are their needs? What is a reasonable amount of time for you to be working on this? And I think you have to really do an assessment about, you know, what your ability to meet all your needs is if you want to keep those relationships happy. And I do. It's very important to me that my wife is happy and my kids are happy. Um, so I, I think about that. And I think that's really important. Um, and in terms of balance, you know, the funny thing is, is that for me, photography it's not like a second job it's still something that i love and i'm passionate about and so it's something that i want to do um and i think when you have a full-time job and other responsibilities what i find is that you know some weeks i'm doing a lot of work in photography and some weeks maybe i'm not doing any very little kind of go with the ebb and flow with that and you know someone someone said to me kevin how do you get all this done I have one friend the systems all the time you know you're you're a full-time lawyer you know you do photography you know you do martial arts you do other things how do you get all this done and i say i plan things out weeks ahead of time and i give myself extra time to get stuff done and if people don't respect my time and cancel on me you know late or whatever then you know i might have to cut those people out you know like it, i have to be particular with my time and I have to be, you know, not rigid, but I have to stick to that and plan out so that I can do things. And I think that kind of planning is really important. There's another piece of this that to, for our, for our audience out there that they need to know too. Kevin's wife is a phenomenal pianist 
and has her own business with two grand pianos in their living room and has a waiting list. What is it? A year now? Uh, two years. Corner? She wrote a book, two? the two year wait list. Yeah. Okay. So she's, she's got a waiting list. Yeah. She's got a waiting list for two years. Um, and as an author and she's got her own business there. And I think, I think you hit on something about, about keeping the people closest to you, um, plugged in to what's going on. But there's another piece that you kind of glossed over. You are a fanatic about taking time for yourself, whether it's hitting the ocean to surf, whether it's martial arts, whether it's just out. I mean, I don't know how many times I've called you and you're out on a walk or a jog um, because you do maintain that balance. It's not just plugging everybody else in. It's making sure that that you're plugged in to the things that you personally need to just feel good and have the energy you want to do everything. Yes, I, I think that kind of self care, especially as we've seen this last year, is really important. Where you know, we, whatever it is that you need to do. I mean, for me, I if I don't get in, you know, about an hour of exercise a day minimum, I'm not a happy person, and my and my my family's not happy. I'm not happy. It's, just, <laughs> it's not good. And I'm lucky that my wife is really supportive, and she's like, "You need to leave and go do whatever you need to do for an hour to get some exercise <laughs> and come back less cranky." <laughs> Well, I'm the same. I'm the same way. Only difference is that if I don't think about exercising for an hour, I don't. I just don't feel good. Oh, the word is procrastination, everybody. In summary, I think, you know, checking in with the people around you, planning and ahead of time to give yourself enough time and, and you know, trying to find that balance of what you need is, is the way to go. Um, but you do have to give some thought to it. And what are your priorities? And I, I kind of, I have a little mantra and I thought to myself, like, what are my priorities? I was reevaluating a couple of years ago and I thought about it and my priorities are family first. Number one, two is be a professional and three is have fun. That's kind of how I try to calibrate things. There's a certain pur purposefulness. Is that a word? Purposefulness? I think so. Sure. Now. You, you, there we go. You're very purposeful. There we go. Kevin, in, in how you live your life, it's, it's, it's like a holistic approach. And I like that you're fostering your personal relationships with your family. And you mentioned the ebb and flow between balancing different careers. And as I'm looking at your bio, I am just stunned at the exhibitions that you've had and you've won awards, you're teaching lessons, um, you're doing portraits, special events, sports, photography, you're doing a lot. And I'm curious if we could just to kind of switch gears, because it's clear that you have a lot of connections that you've built over the years. And I'd kind of like to go back in time a little bit to when you were first starting out. Um, you mentioned back in 2008, you kind of took the leap. How did you begin to gain momentum um, and specifically as you gain momentum with your business how did the role of relationship building with clients come into play I hope I asked that in a non-confusing way does that make sense you did it's, it's a big question with many parts to it so I'll try <laughs> I'll try and break it down um, how did I do it um, well you know, I think the first thing was to follow the passion of what I really liked and to want to get good at it. And so I try, you know, I'm, I'm a person who likes to research things. So I talked to people, I would go to exhibits, I would talk to people that were professionals in the field and get to know them and try to study the masters. And they, someone said to me, you know, study the people who've come before you, you know, there's a lot of people who came before you and learn it. So, you know, I would do research on, you know, who were the great landscape photographers and people who I like, like, you know, Salgado, Sebastian Salgado, or, you know, Michael Kenna, and, you know, look at their work and buy their books and see their exhibitions and, you know, learn from them. And, and then relationship building is, is really crucial. I try to say thank you as much as I can. I try to be humble. Um, and in terms of relationship building and learning, one thing I, I'm, I'm not, if I have one superpower, it's that I'm not afraid to fail spectacularly. And I do fail spectacularly and publicly at times. Um, and so I will go up to people that I don't know and say, Hey, I'd like to learn from you. I'll carry your bags. I'll take a day off my day job and you know, I'll, I'll carry your bags and just, will you teach me a little? And, and that's what I've done. I've gone to different professionals and said, I'll show up and you don't have to pay me. And I just want to learn. 
um, people if I respect their work, you know, I try to do that. And, and then just saying thank you, you know, a lot, I think is really important and showing gratitude, being humble. And you are, and you are, and it, it, it does make it, it, it makes it really fun um, to work with you because we've been involved in a few different projects now, but that that's a perfect segue into the diversity in your skill set. Because you did start out when you and I first met, and again it was through Tamron, which you mm-hmm. which you still shoot um, nonstop today. Tamron has been uh, great, and I am so grateful to them for their support and the quality and value proposition, their lenses. I mean, I, I love their stuff. They've been great to work with. Well, when we when when our friendship started, you were primarily doing the landscape. Talk about the transition into portraiture not only into you wanting to do it but how were you finding where where were you finding the time to practice where was the inspiration and where did you hope to go with this because that the the project you did um that i was involved in and developing I just, men thank you developing men um was was 100 a portrait uh project right. with right. with individual por- formal portraits together with more of an environmental portrait, combining those two with each person that you had featured in the exhibit. Right, right. So the the transition, that's a really good question. Um, How did it happen? I I started looking at a lot of different portraits and and people who are doing them, and I think I kind of fell in love with the lighting, and I was just really curious about it. You know, I love really good lighting is really important whether you're shooting landscapes or whether you're shooting people it doesn't matter you have to have beautiful lighting to have something you know that that is attractive to the eye and interesting and i tend to favor dark and moody landscapes and i tend to favor dark and moody portraits uh, but it's the contrast and having that in there and so i started looking at, at various portraits and the lighting i was like how do they do that how do you control that and i realized that i didn't have that skill set and i was like you know i want to get i want to figure that out how does that work and so I, I volunteered to, you know, hold bags for people and go on shoots. And I read voraciously. I got as many books as I could. I took workshops and I paid to take workshops from people. Um, and then I just experimented. You know, I created a little studio in my garage and just would experiment and have people come over and, and practice the lighting and sign up for webinars. Um, and I just wanted to learn it. And so I kept doing it. And it just took, I mean, I'm still learning, obviously. You know, it takes years and years and years to become really good at it. Um, but, you know, after about, I don't know, eight years, nine years of really working on it part time, I felt competent, <laughs> not expert, but competent. You know, like I have high standards for what I expect in my output. And um, and so the developing men portrait session came along there were a number of things that came together. Um, did you want to talk about that now? The, the, yeah, throw that throw that in because that's a perfect example of you taking the, the the portrait specialty and weaving it in and absolutely taking no prisoners. <laughs> well, thank you. It's the the developing men series was uh, I, I've done about thirty exhibitions now. I've had three solo shows. That was my third solo show, and I. Uh, photographed 15 men, two portraits each, one formal and one environmental of each. So we had 30 portraits uh, of men that I did over about 18 months. And I traveled to, I think it was nine cities, two coasts. Uh, Tehran was great to help sponsor for that. And you were, I was so glad you were in it and you helped me. Um, and it was a, it's a contemporary examination of male friendship, masculinity, isolation, community, and legacy. And it's a mouthful, but there were a lot of concepts that were floating around in my head for a while. I don't know how you guys work, but for me, I have a lot of concepts that float around in my head and then they kind of get pulled together into a string. And so I wanted to do this project. So there were three parts to it. There were portraits, there was a written word, and there was a video. And so we photographed and did portraits of everyone. I had written word on my thoughts, which is, it's on my website. Uh, developing men about those concepts and then interviewing men about these concepts and what they thought about masculinity and community and isolation and legacy, you know, um, and there were a number of reasons, you know, um, I'm, I turned 52 this year. My father passed when I was 52. And so that was sort of confronting my own mortality and my brother uh, was fighting 
stage four cancer and unfortunately lost that battle last year after three years of fighting quite bravely. And so there were a lot of questions in my head about, you know, what kind of parent do I want to be? What kind of father do I want to be? What's my, you know, what does masculinity mean to be a, when you're a father of a boy and a girl? What does that mean to pass that on? Or how does that affect your kids? And what's your legacy going to be? So I wanted to explore this with 15 men that I respected and believed could have a conversation that was intelligent and thoughtful about it. And um, so surprisingly, Skip, you made the cut, but it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have been disappointed in you if you hadn't taken that shot. <laughs> you, were, you, you were great. And, and it turned out really well. I learned a ton. Uh, the, the lighting and the portraits, I'm super happy with the written word. I'm super happy with um, the, the video. I learned a ton. I made a lot of mistakes. I learned about audio and recording, and I'm much better at it than I was two years ago. And so it was an incredible learning experience. And at the end, I had an exhibition where we put it up in the South Bay Artist Collective in a gallery for a week. Um, and it was just great. Well, that the next place to go from talking about that is what are the – go into the top two or three things that – people need to consider if they're going to do their own exhibition because that blog post and we'll have the we'll have the link to that um with the podcast because that three-part blog post really took people into incredible detail even down to the temperature of the lights you needed to have so you want me to take three hours of our podcast and give you two things? Is that what you're asking me? <laughs> well, no, but if you're going to take three hours, give us ten things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, what? Um, are, what? Are, go back farther. Maybe it, maybe it's just what people need to consider. Everybody says – it's like people that say – I really want to do a book someday, but they never sit down and actually think through what's the purpose of the book. Sure. So sure. what are what are what are some of the key things that people have to consider? We don't have to go into the three most sure. important things, but what do they have to consider when they're when they start thinking about, okay, I'm really gonna do this now. Sure. Where do you go from sure. there? And and, and I, I was I mean, of course I'm just teasing. Um, but I, I would definitely encourage people if you've been shooting for a while, I would encourage people wholeheartedly to print your work and frame it and show it because it will make you better. It, you'll look at things in a different way. You will learn about printing. You will learn about framing. You can learn about how to put things up. You can learn about marketing. There's a million things that you're gonna learn in the process of putting on a show that are going to make you better and more conversant. And it gives you some social credibility too. People wanna say, oh, you've had exhibitions. Okay, you've been there, so you're selling your work and you wanna raise your prices. It's like, yeah, I put in the work. You know, I, I did shows and I put it together and I understand what that means. And you can have a different kind of conversation with people. But I think the key thing is to decide that you have, you know, one, two, 10, 20 images, whatever the number is that you wanna put up and learn about printing. Um, and if you, if you don't know how to print, Go to some pros, talk to some people who are really good, you know, go to Bay Photo or go to White Wall or go someplace and get it printed. Learn how to calibrate your, you know, your monitors and your printers, learn how to set up a show. The other thing that you and I have talked a lot about, Skip, is, is partnering with people, partner with people who know what they're doing, who've maybe done it before. And you could, you know, share the money, share the cost, share the time and learn from each other in terms of putting on things and sharing marketing expenses or sharing, you know, uh, you know, renting a gallery or sharing, you know, the expenses for a wine or whatever you're going to have, you know, on the night that you're going to serve. There's, there's ways to make it less expensive, um, but it's really worth it and it will make you a better photographer to do it. Well, that's a perfect, that's one more segue. Talk, just explain what the South Bay Artist Collective is. Sure. Uh, the South Bay Artist Collective, I live in, uh, this, in the South Bay area of Los Angeles. It's about an hour from downtown LA and we have 30 we might be up to 35 artists now who are painters and photographers and sculptors and you know mixed media artists who work together we pay monthly dues for a gallery we work together we market we put on shows we support each other and it's a great way for our artists to interact um, and get to know the artist community we, we you know we help each other out in a lot of ways whether it's you know here's a lead on a place to get a good deal in printing here's a lead on a place that needs some art for sale maybe you could sell it um and just to be exposed to other creatives you know have other people around it's really it, it kind of helps fill your cup 
in a good way. Now, for everybody listening, what I love about this is that this is a partnership between a group of artists where the, the finished product is having a place uh, to call home, to be able to show your work, to be able to do exhibitions. I know it, it, at times there are multiple artists that will have um, gallery shows um, at the collective, and it gives people an opportunity to see your work. But then you've also got the ability to network and cross-promote, or cr not necessarily cross promote but you've got cross exposure with the audience that's coming in to see um, a sculptor's work at the same time your work as a photographer might be on display and it's just such a great partnership you know you don't have to do everything out there solo everybody you can look for ways to partner and share those costs that kevin's talking about but this is one that i love because it's it's ongoing it's a full-time commitment, and when you've got 30-plus people paying dues to a location, to a building, to be able to have something that functions as a gallery, it's something that most people would never do on their own, or for that matter, most people couldn't afford on their own. Absolutely, and we've, we've started expanding. It's in, uh, it's in Hermosa Beach. It's at the Resin Gallery in Hermosa Beach, California, and uh, we've also started providing classes for kids, too, so that's a big part of what we do, whether arts classes and photography classes and other things, and, you know, some, um, you know, classes that sort of blend, you know, um, awareness and, you know, other ways to learn about the arts with, with actually practicing the arts and mindfulness. So we've got some really cool classes that we do to support the community, interact with the community, and bring value to that community. Oh my goodness, Kevin, I'm just a fly on the wall right now. This is amazing. Uh, so I'm looking through your, your exhibits, your publications, and it is, it's downright impressive how many installations you've had over the years. Thank you. And, very kind. You know, I've got so many questions. <laughs> and yet we're coming to the end of this interview. We're going to have to have you back. I mean, just the topic of putting on your own exhibition, especially for those creative artists out there who have never done that. It's such a huge topic in and of it's itself. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And, and you got to do it. You just got to go for it. You know, you, you get better by doing it. I, I would love to come back and have a conversation with you about any time. Absolutely. I'm over here speaking for the both of us. I'm sure Skip doesn't mind <laughs> having you I come don't back want on because I, I don't want him. <laughs> I don't want him back. Oh, well, that's too bad, Skip. After He's after we're back. done here, that's that's <laughs> it. He's finished. It's over. It's over. <laughs> oh. Hey, can we? I, I want to jump in on just one thing here, although I think Shamira had some go ahead. direction she was going to go in. You did a stunning portrait of Noreen at a Steinway in the Steinway store um, in where, Beverly Hills? Yes. Um, talk about that relationship in terms of, I mean, here you were photographing her for, um, well, it was really, it was, it was for you guys, right? There was no, the client was, was Noreen. It's, it's a couple of things. Yeah, it was primarily for Noreen. Uh, we're also, you know, we have some Steinways, and Steinway has been really good to us, and so we took some images for them, and we're actually uh, preparing a proposal for Steinway Magazine to try and get it published in there, too. So we'll see. Ask me ask me in a couple of months how that goes. Noreen's going to write an article for them uh, on the type of piano business that she runs and music teachers and Steinways for that, and then we're going to pitch the thing. Um, so maybe it'll end up in that magazine but it was also you know just to have an heirloom we're, we're really big into having you know a few nice prints to have and, and put up on the wall of, of us at various times in our life because you know you're never as young as you are today boy isn't that true yes yes um, i hope you don't mind skip i want to sneak in one more question before oh, we go ask ahead. our no. favorite final Great. question so it's interesting kevin that you've been a judge on mm -hmm. a number of national photography competitions. And so from the standpoint of a judge, what have you noticed that, how do I phrase this? Cause I'm not trying to tear anyone down and we are all works in progress, but That's true. Skill, that is true. yes, <laughs> myself so much included, but skill set wise, I guess, image quality wise, even what areas have you noticed that photographers are lacking in? 
as a Ooh. judge, what stands, Ooh. what has stood out to you? Ooh, that's, that's tough. Um, it, it, it also it depends on what level we're talking about. It's a really good question, right? I think you're, I, I suspect you're coming from a, a place where you're saying, what have you noticed that we can help our photographers who are listening to improve what they're doing, right? right? Not I trying suspect, to pick on anybody. Right, yes. right. I suspect that's where you're coming from. So there's, you know, there's, there's different levels, uh, not surprisingly, of photography competitions and, and expertise, right? The same you know, you're going to judge something different if someone's been working for, you know, as a photographer for five years and someone has been doing it for 30 years. You know, there's different mm -hmm. levels and people are going to have more or less experience. Um, but at, at sort of the beginning level, I think composition is everything. Um, I have a, a good friend, Victor Hugo Zayas, who's a, a wonderful painter. Um, and, you know, I, I, I photographed him and some of his work and, and for the Laguna Art Museum. And he always says to me, Kevin, composition 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 what about the lighting no he's like composition composition <laughs> composition it's all composition and you know in, in some ways he's right you know if the light it doesn't matter if the lighting is great or everything is right but the composition is bad you know or, or off it's not going to work i think having some sort of leading lines into the image um with composition and lighting you know i think is is really important that that grabs your eye um another friend of mine is a, a really good good photographer she's great she always tells me that your eyes have to have a way into the image and so think about how you, you know if, if it's a landscape for example you're traveling your eyes are working into you know maybe a foreground and then into the midsection and then maybe into a sky how are your eyes going to travel and hopefully you can create that with composition but you might also be able to you know assist that with lighting and dodging and burning you know in post mm. i want to i want to Wow. Yeah, composition, but I want to define it one step further for everybody. If you're entering prints in competition, and this should also apply to your own online galleries, you want to only show what I call wow prints. Now, a wow print is a print that's so good, it's the only one you would have to show to get hired. If you meet that qualification, you know when you look at your own work. You know, you know hey, this is really good, or... Oh, yeah, it's good, but everybody has the same shot. And this applies to portrait artists. It applies to wedding albums. It, 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 it's across the board. You, you want that image that leaves people with that, you know, sucking all the air out of the universe sound when they take a look at it. That's a really and good there point, you go. Skip. There's a, a, a point of totally useless wisdom from <laughs> yours truly. No, not at all. Well, You're right. Great. You know, it's it's hard as artists. We want to share our latest and greatest work. And, you know, we love this for one reason or another. But, you know, really on your website, you should narrow it down to your best. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. And that's it's it's hard to, to call like that. To call your own work is hard sometimes. Yep. Yes, it is. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Kevin, this has been amazing. And I, I always say this, but the time passes so fast. I'm always sad when we get to the end of these interviews. But I do want to make sure and get to our favorite final question. And it's so relevant now, especially with so many photographers um, trying to kind of restart things after COVID. And then there's the round of people who have maybe been considering photography, getting into it. And now as the economy open is opening up, maybe they're willing to kind of take that jump. So for those listeners who are just starting out in photography, what advice would you give them as far as getting started? What's the one most important thing? Oh, do I have to give one? <laughs> if two come to mind, go for it. Uh, all right. I, I'll be short. I'll put it this way. I know we're, we're short on time. I, I would say, you know, follow your passion. If you're passionate about one area of photography and you love it, you know, follow that, you know, because it'll be more interesting and, and in some ways easier for you. The other pieces that I would say are study the masters people have come before you read about it go to museums you know find out who the greatest people are in the type of photography that you're interested in and buy their books you know pay, you know patronize their stuff follow them buy their books ask questions and be humble you know volunteer your time to work with other people and help other people along the way those are probably the top three that i would have that's perfect. That's the perfect Good way to stuff. wrap up this interview. Oh my Good goodness. Stuff. Yes. Uh, Kevin, where can people check you out online? Thank you for asking. 
my uh, my website is www.photosbycag, P-H-O-T-O-S-B-Y-K-A-G.com. And you can also find me at Photos by CAG on Insta and Twitter, et cetera, and Perfect. LinkedIn. Yep. I'll make sure and include those links in the show notes for sure. And Skip, where can folks get a hold of you? I think everybody out there that listens to this podcast can lip sync with me here now all together. <laughs> Everything I write is always at skipcohenuniversity.com. My email is skip at mei500.com. We would love to get your feedback and suggestions on future guests and on Twitter and on Facebook. Nothing creative here, just my name. You'll find me as Skip Cohen. And it's just great getting feedback from all of you guys out there. So let us know what you're thinking and what you'd like us to talk about next. And as I always ask again, Shamira, where do they go to find you? Yes, folks can send me an email at Shamira at photofocus.com. That's my first name, C-H-A-M-I-R-A at photofocus.com. I've got a handful of emails, but they all go to the same place. So you can hit me up there with questions, ideas. As Skip mentioned, we love getting feedback from our listeners because it shapes how we move forward in this show with this show. And we are all in this together. Kevin, thank you again. This has been awesome. Just really good stuff, it. buddy. Thank you so much. The two of you are both so gracious. You know, if you don't know these guys offline, they're just as gracious in person uh, when you talk to them as they are on the show. There's no phony baloney here. These are two of the nicest people you're going to meet. And you guys are so gracious with your expertise and, and sharing and helping people. So thank you. I'm, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you. All right. I'll rip up the check you sent me for your intro. <laughs> I won't. I was post dated anyway, which would bother me. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. And we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they have the burning desire to bring their businesses up to the next level. We are all in this together. We look forward to having you with us next time on the Mind Your Own Business podcast, brought to you by Photofocus and Skip Cohen University. 